just like it says in John chapter, John chapter 5, where he says that the resurrection of the just and the unjust. What's he say there in John 5, 28 and 29? He says that the resurrection of the just and the unjust at the end, those that done good to the resurrection of life and those that done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. It's always the deeds that determine the outcome. It's always. Because why? You're capable of those deeds. They're a necessity because God placed within you the capacity and the ability to do them. Not the same ability in every one. We love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Not mine. Not someone else's that's stronger than me. No, with all yours. Each one is given according to his ability. It tells in the parable of the talents. Each one according to his ability. But man has no ability. He saved by faith alone. God does it all for him. See, that's fallacy. It's fallacy. It's the wicked or the righteous. Just like we've quoted in that 1 John 3.12 about Cain, the wicked one that murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. That's simply the case. The wicked will always hate the righteous. That's why they impugn the character of those that walk in purity towards God. And they call us self-righteous. And they call, uh, call us we're going to hell all the time. And like I say, no one that I ever seen that came through that narrow gate of true repentance ever came out of it with full of pride and arrogance and pointing a finger at everybody else. They came, they came out of it humbled and drawn near to God in a contrite spirit in true godliness and holiness. That's what they came through it as. See, Abel did right, Cain did wrong. End of story, okay? That's simple. You reap what you sow. Back to the Galatian scripture. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For if he sows to the flesh, he will of the flesh reap corruption. But if he sows to the Spirit, he will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Sowing, of course, it requires an effort. <clears throat> So don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not, if you don't give up. That's why he says endure to the end. That's why he talks about finishing the race. So you can't sit back and relax after you've received justification, thinking that he did it for you, and after you receive Jesus, well then everything's paid off and your past, present, and future sins, and he suffered the wrath of God in your place, and there's nothing yet for you to do. See, that, of course, is a false assumption of salvation. You've yet to do your first works of repentance proven by deeds. Produce repentance proven by deeds. Just like it started out with John the Baptist, and then the Lord, and then everyone else. Repent, re pre preach repentance for remission. Not receive for remiss remission. Not trust for remission. Repentance for remission to come clean of sin. These heretics that are out there now, like Hovine and so, so many others, that are talking about, well, there's no scripture that says you've got to repent of your sins. They're heretics, okay? They're savage wolves. They're going to send you to perdition if you listen to them. You must turn from your sins in repentance. See, but deeds then to these people then are considered works. And of course, he justifies the ungodly apart from works. End all. Receive all in their replacement theology. So to them, a substitutionary savior then necessitates a replacement theology. So the deeds of faith are replaced by faith alone, and justification apart from works is the end all, receive all for the saved and sin crowd. And that's what they rely on. Well doing wouldn't benefit them in the least anyway. They're correct in saying that their righteousness is filthy rags because why? Be their hearts remain defiled. They haven't been purified through the repentance or empowered by grace because they haven't produced deeds worthy of repentance. So yeah, it is indeed filthy rags, unacceptable to God. They do a lot of good works in the churches. But what's happened in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23? They did all those works. He's not talking to heathens or Muslims or Buddhists there. He's talking to people that thought that they were doing the right thing. We did all these mighty works in your name. What's the Lord say? I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. See, you can't escape the consequences of your works. 
your works of sin and iniquity, filthy rags, nobody's perfect, Romans wretch, sin every day in thought, word, and deed. You, you can't escape that. The consequences of that is death, is death. If there's been no cessation of sin in your life, and you number yourself among the wicked all day long, like you people do. Oh, there's none righteous, no, not one, and the heart's deceitfully wicked, and all my works are filthy rags, and if I say I have no sin, I'm a liar, and, and I go astray from the room, womb speaking lies, and it's not, a, not what anything I do. Nobody's perfect, just forgiven. You sin daily in thought, word, and deed, and on and on and on, taking every passage in the Scripture that numbers you with the wicked. And that, that's what all those passages are doing, as I've pointed out in my past videos. Every one of those passages is talking about the wicked in contrast to the righteous that will inherit eternal life. But you number yourself among the wicked and think that you're going to inherit an eternal life by works of iniquity. But the Lord's going to tell you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Depart from me, you lazy and slothful, wicked servant. Depart from me, you goats, the tares, because you didn't perform the deeds necessary to come into a right relationship with God. But see, across that great divide, as I've called it in the past, that great divide of professed Christianity, the filthy rags bunch, there are those people that honestly will come into the light and confess and forsake their evil deeds and be truly born of the Spirit in that miracle regeneration and new birth. Have their eyes of their understanding open. Be refreshed in their spirit. And then they'll understand that their deeds are clearly seen that they are done in God. Just like J John chapter th 3 talks about. See, those doing evil won't come to the light, at least their deeds be exposed. See, but those that have come into that right relationship have their deeds clearly seen that they're done in God. See, the precious blood of Christ washed away their past sins, and grace has empowered them in their daily walk with Christ to live godly in the present age. And they produce good fruit necessary to remain in Christ, for every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, the scripture says. They have the true testimony of Jesus Christ in them, and they do not question their obligation of patient continuance and well-doing to enter the kingdom. They just do it because they love God. If you love me, you'll do it. You'll keep my commandments. You'll walk in faithfulness. They let their light so shine before men that they may see the good works and glorify the Father that's in heaven. Not the filthy rags, not the sin daily, not the activity and the filth that's going on in the churches. No, the good works, the good works of righteousness. What are these good works that God requires? It's seen as living evidence that Christ is dwelling in you, that you invitate his life and his purity. He that has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. He who does what is right is righteous as he is righteous. I know you would not of works, faith alone people hate the word righteousness. You despise it with all your heart and all your soul. But it's those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's those whose righteousness exceed that of the religious hypocrites of the scribes and Pharisees and even those in your own churches that will enter the kingdom of heaven. For blessed are the pure at heart, because they will see God. And heart purity is not a positional thing, it's a reality in Christ. So while the professed are busy running around telling everybody how filthy they are and how much they sin every day, crying about nobody's perfect all day long, and defending their sins, the saints are glorifying God by doing well. That's what I see. There's not very many of us, we certainly are the remnant, but that's what I see him doing. For this is the will of God that by doing well, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. 1 Peter 2.15 Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason that a hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when you, they defame you as evildoers and they revile you, They'll see your good conduct in Christ and may be ashamed. For is it better, it is the will of God to suffer for doing well than for doing evil. In 1 Peter 3, 15 and through 17. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing well, as he is a faithful creator. Folks, 
as partaker of the divine nature. All things pertain to life <coughs> and godliness that are freely given to us. The exceeding great and precious promises to be a partaker of the divine nature in Christ, to be part of that spirit, spiritual rebirth, to run the race with endurance, to make your calling sure, to obey Christ, to abstain from all forms of evil and walk uprightly in purity and truth. That's what the people in Christ have. The peace that passes understanding. Not as the world gives peace, not this mess that they give some kind of false assurance, assurance that seems to sear the conscience of so many people. But walking that highway of the upright, departing from evil and keeping themselves in that way to preserve their soul for all eternity so that they're not just in word but in deed in truth they're serving God that's why Isaiah says woe unto you woe unto you people that call evil good and good evil that take bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter See, woe unto this generation that impugns those that walk in purity. Even though we are so few, they would rather see us dead and burned at the stake, so to speak, than being such a contrast to the darkness that they're in. See, if the light in you, see the, the, the eyes, the lamp of the body, <clears throat> see if the whole body, if the eye is good, the whole body's full of light. But if the eye is bad, the whole body is full of darkness. And how great is that darkness? He says in Matthew 6, 23. See, how great is that darkness in the people under this faith alone, no effort required, not a works, filthy rags religion, where deeds are thrown out the window. How great is that darkness? Because they think they're in the light. And they condemn anyone that walks in that light. But those of you that want Christ, that want to know Him, that want to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust, in this mess that is upon us, in our world today and getting worse by the minute, you can find it in Christ. If you seek, if you draw near, if you come clean, you'll find it.